to a short introduction, and then we start. Lugu peetud kollegid, head üliõpilased, külalised, tere tulemast meie järjekordsele loengule, mis on pühendatud sügisel saabuvale konverentsile innovatsioon ja digitaal reaalsus loodetavasti toimumus 6. septembril. Ja üheks meie peaesinejaks oli planeeritud professor Antoine Pico, aga ta ei saa kahjuks tulla. See tõttu me tegime eelloengud ja see on juba neljas eelloeng sellest sarjast ja loodetavasti tuleb veel üks loeng. Täna loeng on inglise keeles, see tõttu ma räägin edasi inglise keeles. Dear colleagues, good students, guests, welcome to our lecture in the series of innovation and digital reality. The second in the series of international conferences that will take place on 6th of September this year, hopefully. And uh, today we have a fantastic opportunity to listen to Professor Antoine Picon from uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he is Professor of History and Theory of Architecture, as well as Chair of the Doctoral Panel. And uh, I don't think he needs much introduction. Antoine has been here several times and hopefully will come soon again. Without further ado, the floor is yours. Please join me welcoming Professor Antoine Bicot. Thank you. I would like first to thank Professor Yuri Solep and the Estonian Academy of Art to have me today. It's always a pleasure to be in Tallinn, though I have to say I still don't understand a word of Estonian, but, you know, someday perhaps. Uh, so my lecture is about AI in architecture seen from the point of view of a theorist and a historian. And in history theory, change and innovation are crucial questions indeed. In the domain of digital architecture, AI, it's pretty evident, is the next step about to be taken. Now, with the rapid development of digital technologies, the most common question is about what they will be to, able to achieve in the near future. This is especially true when dealing with a topic such as artificial intelligence, what is AI uh, going to be able to do in the future. I think another crucial problem has to do with the roles that the human will play in a digitally AI permeated future. What will be their role in the design process in a few decades from now if AI has the success that everybody is uh, predicting? This is related for me to a more general question. Usually with innovation, one looks at what is changing, what will change, etc. But actually, the question of what will remain the same is equally crucial. Take our recent transition to online teaching, the question, you know, whether we like it or not, the question is perhaps not so much at about what will be online in the near future, whether we like it or not, Zoom is going to stay with us for a very long time, but, rather, but the question is rather what should remain in person? And this is probably one of the big questions in pedagogy in the near future. So if we return now to artificial intelligence, there are raging debates regarding AI and its real possibilities. Some see no limit to what AI is going to be able to achieve, while others insist to the contrary on the current limitation of artificial intelligence development and the difficulty one will have to overcome them. So far, it's worth remembering that deep learning is still specialized, far from the multipurpose intelligence that we possess. The question is not only technological, it has also to do with economics and politics. While authors like Jeremy Rifkin are awaiting a third industrial revolution based on extended automation that will free human from labor, others observe that human are still a very cheap 
source of labor, of sophisticated labor, in the, especially in the developing world, compared to our expensive digital machines. But despite these legitimate doubts, let's assume that AI will become a pervasive reality in design, and let's examine, without fear or nostalgia, a number of questions that this development will raise. Again, the central one may be about the role of the humans in such a context. So, of course, talking to, about humans is a bit old-fashioned if you're an elegant social thinker because we are, have a lot of discourses about the need to be less human-centered, about the necessity to treat non-humans with a fairness that we usually reserve to humans, etc. This context is also connected to the post-human. To what extent are we still human beings in an age of technological augmentation? I would argue that, and I'll come back to this issue later, that the truth is that we're still very much humans. And the terrible war that is raging not so far from us, and I know there are a number of Ukrainian students among you, reminds us, unfortunately, with his terrible series of deaths and injured, that we are humans. So more prosaically, we are more than ever preoccupied by questions such as finding and keeping jobs, being able to express ourselves in a creative way. So hence my question, which will be a little bit, you know, uh, the spine of this lecture, what could be the role of human in an AI-driven design context? But before doing that, I'd like to begin by an apparently naive interrogation. Why is it that we want so much to automate not only fabrication, this has already started for a while, but also large parts of the design process itself. Why is it that we're gradually passing from a discourse on robots to a discourse on AI in architecture? Why are we so keen on automating design beginning with fabrication? The truth is that automation may could very well not be not an entirely rational enterprise. It may be all the more avoidable that it is rooted in something else than rational calculation. Or it may be that rationality is never completely reasonable. It obeys impulses that we do not necessarily control. And God knows these days how impulses are very present in the world. We believe that automation is entirely objective. Actually, it is grounded in something more profound that has to do with the recognition that there are forces in the world that go far beyond the usual factors that shape our ordinary actions and productions. How to be plugged in these forces was a question that the surrealist movement had tried to raise through their practice of what they called automatic writing. And, they were, and the reason I'm mentioning the surrealists is not only because of their extensive use of the notion of automatic, automatic writing, and more generally automatic creation as a way to go beyond ordinary artistic production. And here we have a so-called automatic drawing from 1924 by the painter André Masson. But because the surrealists saw this question of automatism as a way to tap into more fundamental forces uh, forces that move the unconscious. So among their disciples was a young intellectual who was later to become one of the major post-war French sociologists, Pierre Naville. After the war, Naville worked actually on the early stages of, of automation in the French industry. And he was a keen observer of the massive transformation that were affecting this industry. But while doing empirical work on what was happening, how automation was actually really taking place on the floor of factories, he remained sensitive to some of these, the issues that Surrealist had taught him. And he famously declared in a very influential piece at the time called Vers l'automatisme social, towards social automatism, that, and I quote, I'm not far to believe and I, I won't read entirely, that automatism represents an archetype as ancient and as radical as our sense of symmetry or cycle, that it touches something intimate in us, a vibrant chord of our creative power that has to do with enchantment, with our will to power, and many other impulses that move us, starting from our unconscious. 
I would say in some ways, I don't believe we can fully understand what's happening with automation if we don't take into account that background. So for Naville, automation was ultimately about this pursuit of what he called automatism. It had to do with a quest for spontaneity that is usually reserved to natural being. It was an attempt to make nature do by itself what we wanted to do. It appeared as a kind of Promethean quest that could never be fully satisfied by our technology as sophisticated as it could be. In other words, it possessed a foundational and even mythical character. So envisaged from this perspective, automation represents something far more fundamental than the ambition to improve efficiency. And I would actually argue that efficiency comes second, second after the enchantment of automation. Another way to put it would be to say that automation has to do with a desire to animate matter, to surround oneself with creatures and creation that seem endowed with something that resemble life. And this is a theme that plays a central role in my most recent book, The Materiality of Architecture. So I hope you'll pardon me if I take some time on unpacking this question, because it's actually something I am really, really interested in. So the first thing to note is this most extreme form of animation, if we take myth, mythology, stories, etc., is when matter, the life of matter, becomes somewhat similar to us. And there is an enduring, a very long history uh, full of stories about matter becoming animate. For example, Pygmalion, uh, uh, you know, uh, sculpting a creature and then falling in love with a creature and the story goes that the creature becomes alive. Or if we go further, this is a pretty bizarre 19th century painting, very sexist, I agree, uh, but on this story. Uh, or take Frankenstein or take, uh, take the golem, et cetera, et cetera. And from the start, actually, robots were part of this lineage. And it's worth remembering that actually the first robots appear at the end of the 19th century in literature, and they inherit this story. Among the first, you find actually a French novel, Lève Futur, The Future Eve, which is about the creation of an artificial woman. But then this idea comes, you know, in the cinema with the robot of Metropolis and so forth and so forth. So to make a long story short, it's pretty evident that the relation between robots and life has, of course, known a new development with artificial intelligence and deep learning. And it's, by the way, quite telling that the evocation of country robots and artificial intelligence oscillate between two poles. On the one hand, we cannot understand anything to, about deep learning as human beings because this is something else really alien. On the other, AI could be perhaps trained like we train children. So uh, you can see not a very simple thing. Uh, what I like with robots is actually that there is always the dichotomy good robot, bad robot. You may remember in Metropolis, the robot is really a bad creature. Uh, why? Because animation is always something that has to do with transgression. Because uh, in many civilizations, the only per, uh, beings that are allowed to animate are gods. And this is what, for example, you find in William Blake, uh, you know, the god animating clay to create the first human beings. So if humans begin to do it, it may end badly. And there you got Frankenstein and all those kinds of stories of animation ending badly. But now let's turn to architecture. Architecture has actually a much more intimate relation to animation than what is usually taken, uh, believed. Uh, one good ex uh, uh, example of that is the, the myth of Amphion, in which Amphion plays the music and the blocks spontaneously put themselves in place. And which is, by the way, one of the reasons of the old metaphor of architecture as frozen music, architecture as a kind of frozen animation of matter. So uh, two things, perhaps. On the one hand, architecture tries to animate matter so that it can enter into a dialogue with humans. And this is what ornament used to be about. Uh, but ornament was not alone. Composition had also to do with it. The Baroque is about animation, but also modernist architecture 
You could say also that La Tourette is an exercise in animation of matter. But on the other hand, animation had to be incomplete. So for a very long time, architecture had to be do do with animation, but an animation leaving aside the question of automatism as we know it today. So what is striking, but perhaps not so striking because we've become completely accustomed to it, is after centuries in which architecture was, you know, a kind of frozen animation, animation has become re real, has become synonymous with movement, and the world of design is populated with all kinds of moving machines that can produce all kinds of things. Uh, and we are slowly pushing the limits of architecture. Responsive environment may be very well the next limits we're going to push with, limit, with buildings that can interact with us. So I'm insisting on that because I'll return at the end to this mythical character. We believe that fabrication and AI were completely rational beings. Truth is, we may be very much well playing, you know, kind of Frankenstein, replaying the myth, and which has to do for me also with poetry, and I'll come back to that towards the end. So, so far, it's pretty clear that what we have under the eyes mostly robots, but we're beginning to see AI. And now I'd like to discuss a few things really about big data, machine learning, and what I've called architectural conversation. So let's jump into the future and assume we have intelligent machines that can really design. Under what condition are we going to get them and how, what kind of relation should we have with them? So condition, first of all, we need big data so that machine can learn and you have a number of designers all over the world which are feeding machines with all kinds of information regarding plants, elevation, except facades, etc., etc., and doctoral dissertation are multiplying on the subject of machine vision, machine learning. Here, for example, Emmanuel Co. Uh, dissertation at EPFL. I don't know whether he's come to Estonia already. Uh, very often with these bizarre uh, Piranesian composition, machine seems to have a certain uh, taste for intricacy, but we have a lot of that. Sometimes uh, very often weird composition, though echoing things we've seen. For example, this is another example, more in the kind of neo-Gaudi uh, way of AI uh, used composition. So now, if they ingest large enough database of types, tectonic details, ornament, <coughs> etc., <cetera, coughs> AI programs may be able, and this is probable, to produce design of their own. But what will they produce? First thing we may note, uh, you know, they are not human, so they may be tempted to combine things that we don't combine usually, for example, Baroque elements with modernist one. And if you go to the Bartlett, for example, every year almost there is a, a thesis in which you have some kind of intelligent program who is doing a bizarre collage of all styles, et cetera, et cetera. So they may combine things in different ways than we do. So two questions arise from this situation. The first, which is pretty common these days, will we ever be able to understand the way mach machine, quote, reason? It's not only a matter of algorithm, by the way. It's, it, it may be that the elements on which the machine base itself to understand what's the built environment may differ from us. Uh, you know, the notion of ceiling may have no interest for a machine, for example. Uh, it may combine things differently. We see that already from one language to another. I'm always struck, for example, the construction language between French and English is completely different. The French poutre is translated by either by truss or beam, and so actually we don't read exactly construction in the same way from one language to another. So with machines, maybe probably even more different. We're beginning to see that also in domains, for example, my friend Carlo Ratti at MIT has been working for a very long time on urban visualization. It is true that machines can see molecules in a city while we saw flows uh, in the traditional ways. Today, machines can see in a very, see cities in a very different way than we do. And, you know, when asked to produce plan, master plan, machines can do sometimes very surprising things. So, again, 
machines may very well not read the world in the way we do, even if we, t we take adversarial network to teach them, etc. But should we want that? I'll come back to that in a moment. This is not a totally recent problem. We've always done things that we barely understand, uh, at least for a very long time. So just a reminder, this pretty element, I don't know whether you notate differential in the same way in Estonia, but you know, the, uh, the differential uh, of calculus was something very mysterious for more than a century. And people wrote endlessly about what is this thing that you could use in calculation and you know, calculus begins to develop at the end of the 17th century, and it's frankly really understood a century and a half later. So, so we can use things, we can trigger mechanism that we do not fully understand in traditional intuitive terms. So it's one of the questions today. So from that, a couple of things. Should we impose? to the machine, because after all, we can do that, to follow the same rules as we do. Should we impose to the machine to read buildings as we do? You know, this is a ceiling, this is a floor, this is a wall, this is a window. Uh, you know, machine can do without having the same taxonomy as we do. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people are doing these today, and reassuringly, in that case, machine begins to produce things that resemble very much what we have. And this is probably what the building industry may want in a number of cases. But that said, is that what we truly want as designers is a question. Because all these interrogation, uh, you know, because it may hamper the creativity of the machine. If you force the machine to be really very much like humans, you know, you may lose part of what makes the, the input of the machine really precious. So all these interrogations actually revolve around one central question, which is even more than the way the ma machine reason, between quotes, what matters is how we enter in a conversation with it. And it is, and in some ways, the problem of AI in architecture may not so much be about what is AI doing by itself, uh, but than about how are we going to have an architectural conversation with it which may seem like a trivial question. It is an old question, actually, and you have a whole range of theorists throughout architectural history that have written about architecture as a conversation. You find that in Alberti. Later, you find that in the first uh, Renaissance uh, modern architect in France, Philibert de Lorme, and this is the plate illustrating what is architecture and good architecture for that matter. And as you can see, good architecture is a conversation between somebody who teaches and somebody who receives the lesson. So it's about communication. So architecture is a conversation. So a good conversation means that you can share something. But of course, if the, you share with someone who has exactly the same ideas, thinks like you, etc., it's no longer a conversation. It's a kind of solipsist. Uh, it's a kind of solipsist situation. You, you look yourself into a mirror. So how do you organize, actually, the resemblance and difference between the way machine and human can communicate? So a couple of things related to that, for me. The first is, if we take seriously the idea that conversation matters, there may be the possibility of kind of return to a linguistic turn in architecture. You know, the idea that architecture is a kind of language that we share with machines, etc. Interestingly, by the way, very often disconnected from those debates, but are there really? There is a kind of postmodernist uh, touch in many creations. Jennifer Bonner, my colleague, would be horrified if she knew what I'm doing with her picture. Uh, but nevertheless, in some of her collage, etc., there is something of this kind of rampant postmodernist sensitivity which is returning these days. Now, conversation, I say you mustn't be the same as the person with whom you talk. A more, at a more profound level, the question raised by the machine may be the question of otherness. Uh, to create, you have to allow something within yourself to become other than yourself. And this is, 
you know, one of the precondition of creation very often. Otherwise, you just repeat yourself. So you have to let otherness uh, take par partially hold of you. So, which what the French poet Rimbaud famously conveyed in his uh, sentence, I is another. So if, you know, the creative self is actually partly foreign, a stranger to he or herself. So why not use the machine, and that would be actually the real interest, probably, of AI, would not be so much, for example, Neil Leach very often starts from the hypothesis that it's an augmentation. I think augmentation may not be that interesting. What is really interesting is that if you're really enter, able to enter in a conversation with a machine and the machine remaining this other that stimulates you, et cetera, but is it reducible to you? So one could, and there again, I'm not sure Gilles will appreciate, but the kind of neo-brutalist uh, 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 tendencies that you see today may have, which are very different from the linguistic turn that I just evoked, may be linked to this uh, question of otherness. But of course, I, uh, this is, uh, these are eminently a uh, complex question. Again, the machine should not be too close to us, nor too foreign. So what is the right distance? Maybe the question. So now, let's move to automation, the automation of design and fabrication. So let's assume again that machines will be able to do more and more. And you know, probably to have the beginning of a conversation that we will impose to the machine that, you know, some basis of conversation. So like, you know, this is a ceiling, this is a door, etc. This is probably what's going to appear. So the question then becomes, you know, uh, what's going to happen? There was for a very long time, we believed that automation would be actually a miracle because it would only impact lowly paid repetitive jobs. Not, of course, the kind of interesting things we do as designers, et cetera, et cetera. Truth is that, uh, that it's not sure that AI may be actually about to impact more profoundly architecture uh, than other practices. One of the reasons has, of course, to do with the fact that architecture is the most formalized of all arts. You know, architecture follows rules, whether we like it or not, and has always followed more stringent rules than other disciplines. Hence, by the way, the kind of connection between architecture and computing that predates by far and large the computer. Uh, you know, Mario Carpo and others like Bernard Cash have written extensively on the links between the five orders, you know, the kind of frenzy about proportion, rules, etc., of the Renaissance and later architecture, and the possibility of computing architecture. So one could say that actually codification is the first step toward actually using, you know, automating design. And in some ways, at the end of the 18th century, very beginning of the 19th century, when the th professor at the Ecole Polytechnique, Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand, imagines this plate, which is modestly entitled, The Path to Follow in the Composition of Any Project. So basically, it's a kind of mechanization of design. You just have to follow the order of the plates, and you will be able to compose whatever project, whatever program you have in mind. So there is a strong stream in architecture of people interested in those questions. You find, for example, much later, a century and a half later, Cedric Price. And uh, Cedric Price, at the time of his generator project, was also interested, how can we formalize the design process so that part of it could be automated? So it's almost certain, if we follow that path, that once you know, a number of technical problems is solved, machines will be at least able to be partners of designers. It's interesting, by the way, for an historian um, that, you know, that when computing began in architecture, it was actually about this conversation between architecture and machines. And if you take, for example, in the 1960s, Nicolas Negroponte architecture group machine, the ancestor of the media lab, it was actually 
about the possibility of a conversation between um, uh, humans and machines and a kind of co-design. And then what happened some 20 years later, what developed was actually computer-aided drawing. And now it seems we're on the, e on the eve of returning to what was the initial ambition, which is really computer-aided design, a conversation. Interestingly also, Negroponte very quickly from those questions went to question of interface between machine and humans because actually this question of conversation came very quickly on the forefront while he was experimenting with his group on the possibility to really co-design with machines. And this is, by the way, why you know, the architecture machine group became the Media Lab, question of interface. So, it's probably, so we are probably going to have to deal in design with a number of non-human forms of intelligence, by the way, which will not necessarily be limited to design proper. Take fabrication. Something that really strikes me is how little we want autonomy we want to give to robots. You know, it's very striking. I wrote a piece once a little bit absurd, but that was for Log, which is a journal that loves to publish absurd pieces, which was on the following themes. If, you know, there are a lot of people these days who claim to be Ruskinian in design, etc. So, you know, empowering, you know, rec recovering the true autonomy of labor, etc. The only thing is that they think of labor only about the designer. And they forget the big thing of Ruskin, which was that actually was not so much about designers, it was about workers. So what if our robots tomorrow should have some degree of autonomy? You know, if you take seam and seal designs, you know, they should perturbate it a little bit, because after all, why should they be told step by step uh, everything instead of having a little bit of creativity? If you begin to have really intelligent robots, why shouldn't they be able to display some kind of creativity? So all that to say that, you know, the question of, you know, how the world of design will look like may be very different in a generation or two from now because of all these forms of non-human intelligence who do not, are not necessarily limited only to machine that help us design, but machine with whom we are in conversation from design to fabrication. Okay, so far? So, before moving to the next step, which we'll be really discussing about what about humans, let me just mention a couple of things about the changes brought to the profession by digital tools, because I'm always struck by the fact that most of the time we talk a lot about, you know, uh, design and digital tools, but not about so much about professional issues. And so, a couple of things. The first one is what has the digital produced in terms of the profession. The first is a massive consolidation of practices. This is a major international practice in the 1950s. You may have recognized the guy with the glasses. Doesn't look that fun. Swiss-born French architects. Uh, so, and you can be an international practice, basically, with, you know, 15 people, etc. That's uh, the pretty much what Le Corbusier's atelier had uh, at its apex. At the time, he's doing Chandigarh, et cetera. Now, with a computer, truth is, we have more larger and larger structure, very often intercontinental, because with the internet, et cetera, we can exchange information and manage multi-continental practices. And this is pretty much what the, it was the top of Zahadid, the top brass of Zahadid, not the 500 other people, uh, a few years ago, shortly before she died. And then you realize that something has happened in the digital age. Something that has happened that we have not fully t measured the consequences. The consequences are actually a bit frightening. One is the risk of obsolescence of designers, because you know, in this big structure, you you know, if you don't make it high enough, you may be replaced because the evolution of software and machine may be more rapid than that of your skills. So that's the first thing. But more profoundly, you know, what they say entail is probably slowly getting out of the star system, even if this is still very much the star system in its purest manifestation. But it means that actually design is becoming more network-like, 
more shared, distributed, etc. So we may have actually to understand authorship, just like we may have in the near future to dialogue with machines, to share with machines authorship, we may have more generally to challenge traditional forms of authorships, which has already begun. I used this picture once because it's actually a fashion show in which you have the fashion designer, but you have Coletti, who designed actually uh, the robot program. Then you had another guy who designed the fabric. Then the actress itself was the Game of Thrones, one of the Games of Thrones actress who was also uh, playing a role. And then you realize there is not a single author. There is a web of authors. And this is what might happen. So may help us to relativize a little bit uh, what's happening. But let me return to my central question. What about humans in this strange world? in which machines could do more and more. So the question is complicated. Guess what? And for an historian, it's all the more complicated that it's actually an old question. To probably many of you don't know who is this guy. It's a guy called Denis Diderot, who is one of the chief editor of the encyclopedia. And Diderot was the son of a knife maker and was absolutely obsessed by machines. And his big question was, to what extent is the mind functioning like a machine? Since we invent machine, we may partially resemble machines. And the machine on the left is actually, he described in detail this machine, which is a machine to weave socks, so, which was a very complex thing in the 18th century. So he was fascinated by trying to understand, by decomposing the machine, trying to understand how the mind that has conceived the machine function and once one had understood that, what could one say about what is mechanical in the mind? So one of the reasons artificial intelligence is born is because we are partially like machines. So to what extent are we not machines, or to what extent are we different, etc.? This is an old question. And by the way, the question for Diderot was also the eyes and other. To what extent also is human creativity different from what machines do, which was not, for him, a completely evident story. And the 18th century was actually really permeated by this question of you know, machine versus human. So it's a pretty old story. So if we are partially resembling machines, what can be unique to what we bring to the table? So, so far, it's good, because we are a much more generalist intelligence. There is no machine in the world that can do as many things, you know, complex, et cetera, than we do. But is it going to be sure in the near future? Two things, uh, or at least one f uh, the, to begin with. The, the first thing, we have an embodied intelligence. Might not seem spectacular, but that's probably one of the most fundamental differences with what we have so far in the realm of the digital. We have a deeply embodied intelligence. Of course, the brain centralizes a number of, of functions, but actually a lot of other functions are linked to the fact that we have a body. Of course, the, the, the body has varied a lot throughout history. This is Leonardo, and of course, this charming person is a very different, uh, inhabiting a very different world in a very different conception of the body. And we all know also, speaking of the post-human, for example, that the post-human means actually a kind of expanded condition of our body in which we have more and more digital prosthesis, among other things, etc. But nevertheless, we do have an embodied intelligence. And it's very striking that, of course, robots have a body, but they do not have you know, this kind of distributed uh, distribution within the body that we have which may account, speaking of animals, for the recent fascination with octopuses. Uh, because, of course, even more than us, octopuses, you know, have a brain, have a brain that, is, uh, uh, that is distributed in their whole body. So as if, you know, we were more octopus than the robots. So let's try to elaborate a little bit about what this means. The first thing is, because we have a body, we have this kind of strange emotion, etc., that mix the purely physical and the mental. And, you know, there are a lot of cognitive sense science revolve on the fact that a lot of things we thought were only mental are actually, you know, this completely physical thing that actually mix 
uh, you know, cognitive and very physical, etc. And I would argue that this is probably at the origin of what produces relevance for us. And ultimately, uh, and also these series of echoes in other minds that we call meaning. And it's for me very telling that for a very long time, meaning in architecture, symbolism in architecture, was linked to the relation to the body. For example, a way to understand what even a simple molding did to a building was by comparing it to what it means to acquire something like a visage. Also, it's quite also striking that the symbolic in architecture for a very long time was directly related beginning with the form of the column and the proportion of the column to the fact that we have bodies. So where do I want to go? That probably in the near future, we can imagine that AI is going to do a lot of things for us, fix a lot of problems, etc. But we still have to decide what truly matters for us. To choose among a range of possible solutions produced by the machine, what seems to us the most relevant. What I've described elsewhere as a kind of shift from tactics to strategy. Tactics is you know, conduct, uh, con, uh, you know, leading operation on the ground day after day. Strategy is about what's the purpose, what's the objective. So in some ways, the why in architecture may become much more important than the how. And if you look at the general evolution of what the digital has done to architecture, it has made possible a kind of surge of the why as opposed to the how. When I was still studying architecture, I remember the how, you know, day after day, toiling, etc., was really a big part. Today, it doesn't mean you spend less hours, but what am I doing? What's the problem, etc., have become the leading question, which you could interpret in some ways the development of parametric design in that, uh, in, in, from that light, just like BIM you know, building information modeling, the question may be by the end, who is doing what at which level, who is authorized to do what? So there again, what are the principles of managing the whole operation and what is the aim? So in some ways, this is for me probably one of the temporary, I'll come back to that, this is only temporary because it might become by the end more ambiguous, one of the temporary answer to this question of humans in an AI, more AI uh, per, uh, permeated or driven world is we still know what matters for humans, perhaps a bit better than machines because we have a body, because through the body we construct the strange symbolic world in which we move. Another way to say that would be to say that this is what makes possible to inhabit. These days have become very old fashioned. I'm back to what does it mean to inhabit? Which means actually to be able to project your body into a space and to define yourself in relation with a space. You could say that part of the role of architecture of humans is actually to specify what kind of inhabitation do they want, which is actually the fundamental question of architecture. Uh, and this is, for me, one of the fundamental questions that led me also to think a little bit about materiality as what enables you to inhabit. So with a kind of return in some ways to the phenomenological, but without the assumption that things are fixed forever, uh, their authenticity is not ne necessarily in the past. It may be very well in the present in, or in the future. So complicated issue, but probably in the near future still solvable of the part of humans in design. What is less clear these days, and uh, the fa I'm mentioning it because this is, in my opinion, one of the uh, you know, kind of domains which is not explored fully, is the future of labor, human labor. You know, what is going to happen? This is a Swedish, you know, real humans, a Swedish series of a few years ago. Uh, but what will become of labor? Because I probably, let's be honest, despite the dream of the digital designer that he's going to be alone with his machine and the building will be built uh, by other machines, I don't think labor is going to disappear. But its place has become very unclear. Uh, in all this discussion, probably because it's a political question. And I would say that by the end, AI, but also more generally automation, 
has to do with a politics of design. We need urgently to redefine a politics of design as envies, as you know, the kind of relation between the various actors and humans, but also machines that are involved in the process. So let me return. I insisted a lot about myth, etc. Let me return to myth and poetics. To be honest, and you know, for those. You know, technology in architecture has usually no relevance if it doesn't, and this is where, by the way, technology in architecture is never a purely rational thing because it has to do with poetics. If you look at the history of industrialization in the 20th century, one of the reasons that make it so powerful, despite its successive failure, etc., was that industrialization, which was already a form of automation, had to do with the enchantment it produced, with the idea of harnessing productive forces, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say one of the questions for digital designers may very well be, what will be the enchantment with AI? What will be the way to recreate fringes of creativity, et cetera, that produces this enchantment. It's probably too early to know. But industrialization is interesting because industrialization was one of the great narrative of the 20th century in the design realm. And it's interesting to note that actually the enchantment was very often at the margin, the margin at which industry and craftsmanship began to blur. This is, for example, typical of Prouvé. I don't know whether you are interested in Prouvé in Estonia, but Prouvé was a very influential figure in France, Germany, etc. And Prouvé remained throughout his life a craftsman while working constantly at the fringe of industrialization. Or, you know, and to take another bizarre figure, Buxnister Fuller was also constantly working at the fringe. This is the Dimaxian car. At the time, Fuller is advocating complete industrialization of the world. And at the same time, the car is a complete bricolage. So design may have to do with the exploration of, of the limits of great rational discourses. A possible path could be actually glitches. And I'm always struck by the number of people today working on digital glitches. Probably it reminds me of how Ruskin was fascinated by imperfection, but how later a Ruskinian in part architect, the same Swiss-born French guy, uh, Le Corbusier, was also interested in the glitches of the, of the mass production of housing, etc. This is the Unité d'Habitation of Marseille, and Le Corbusier was enchanted by the imperfection of the concrete. So you, know, you have a number of people working today, and even Gramatsu and Kohler, who are usually so serious, very seriously produced a few years ago this kind of thing, to explore you know, how to disrupt a little bit processes to create interesting imperfection. But you can also sometimes invert the role instead of humans perturbating the machine, the machine itself doing strange things. And my colleague at Harvard, Andrew Witt, is trying to drive his machine crazy uh, so that they can do strange things. So all that goes back to this idea of negotiation of conversation with machines. So one can be even more futuristic and actually reinventing the dreams of the 1970s. I mentioned Cedric Price. Cedric Price had the idea that actually a conversation should, in, should involve the building itself that would become intelligent and that could enter in conversation with its users. And this is the famous generator project in which the building actually reconfigures itself in a kind of conversation with the user but also, by the way, not following entirely the user suggestion. This is not a classically programmable building. It's a building that introduces incertitude and you know, almost whims of his own, which could be the ultimate form of, uh, of um, animation. Ultimately, so let's go very far in the future. We can even ask ourselves, you know, machines have so far are not very embodied, but is this going to be always the case? 
aren't we going one day to have really to inhabit with non-humans? You know, of course, so far, you know, the vacuum cleaner by Amazon, not a very active thing in our homes, but, you know, why not? And then, it, and then this is why also the animals are so interesting, because actually we've designed for non-humans for centuries, and we still do. Another of my colleagues at Harvard famously designed a village for elephant and people. And uh, so elephants have very specific requirements of their own. For example, they like to sleep, uh, you know, leaning along a wall, which means that you have really to have a very strong reinforced wall somewhere in the house. And they like also, they need windows because they're really affectionate animals and they want to know what's happening. And you realize then, you know, we've designed for dogs, we've designed for uh, horses, etc. We've designed already for non-humans in the long history of design. So why not imagine that one of these days we'll have to design for creatures like that? Uh, well, there is a non-human who is really intent of inhabiting. Uh, okay, uh, so let me try briefly to summarize. Where do I want to go? I want to go to the following that even the key dimension that makes us still vaguely persuaded that we are human as opposed to machine may very well give way in the future. We, we might be one day no longer the only form of a truly embodied intelligence. We might be one day no longer the only forms of life inhabiting space in the traditional architectural sense. We might be then confronted to the fact that we are never completely sure to be human. And I would argue that actually this is what design is about. Design is about what does it mean to be human. And probably the only definition you could give of what it means to be human is to be not so sure of what it means. To be humans is to have doubt. Am I natural? Am I artificial? Am I an animal? Am I actually something different? Uh, truth is, we're always in transition between one thing and its contrary. And this is probably what design and architecture have been about for so long, about what it means actually to be humans in this kind of uncertain state. So in some ways, AI and architecture is a new chapter in this very long history of the relation between design what it mean, and what it means to be humans. And on that and this charming artificial creature, uh, of course, Swedish actress, but uh, nevertheless, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that was not too long. Good. Thank you, Antoine. Have the animation at the end of the lecture from the other. Yeah, I never put any animated picture myself because I belong to a generation that doesn't know how to make them function properly. So um, I'm sure there are questions. Yep, there it comes. I'll be the microphone guy. First of all, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, my question would be, uh, how are we determining the criteria for animation uh, between machine and human? Uh, one could maybe argue, if you want to be, you know, what was the uh, publication that you made the essay for that liked absurd thoughts? That, Sorry? What was the publication that you wrote for that had absurd uh, articles? Uh, it, was, uh, it was a journal called Log. Okay. which is, you know, a little bit chic and nonsensical architectural theory on the East Coast, uh, which, you know, of course, Seal and Seal know all about it. Uh, so I wrote a piece called Free the Robots so, with um, an exclamation mark. We, we are, we begin as two cells. Hmm? Uh, we, we begin as two cells that are, are our design process begins from two bits and a whole cord of DNA, and one could argue that this is a machine-coded uh, methodology of production, and uh, we, we are produced by code, and once we figure out the genomic uh, uh, solution, we're going to be able to alter the code, 
and we will. We are already. All, I have friends who are scientists that won't, you know, they won't get into what we can actually do because it's scary. And uh, so, how do we actually know? How do we discern this? This? Uh, how do we make the discernation between us being? Uh, animate machines or not, and you know we're we're in a school. We're learning by rules. Uh, we follow rules, regulations, stipulations, code, and everything else. So that know. was one of my points. Thank you. Uh, my point is precisely: we're never completely sure. It was already, you know, Diderot did not knew about did not know about DNA, but he suspected that there was something strongly mechanistic in the way we think, which is why the 18th century is so fascinated by computation. You know, from Leibniz to uh, Condillac and others, the 18th century is constantly thinking about computation in philosophical terms. What, why is it that we compute? Uh, and because actually computing is something, and in the 18th century, Leibniz, for example, invents a machine to compute automatically, etc. So we're, truth is, we've never been sure. So my argument is to say by the end to be human is precisely not to be sure that you're a machine, which is, you know, from Blade Runner, you know, from Frankenstein to Blade Runner, an ever-recurring theme. We're not sure. And, and, you know, in some ways we're not sure that, you know, we're not sure that we're human and we invented design to stage us as humans. You know, design provides the scene on which we become human actors. But actors, not sure that the actors are humans, but they play the humans, which is what we do in design. So AI is going to confront us even more because, you know, even the stage now is going to be designed partially in conversation with, uh, you know, which is, by the way, for me, you know, this notion of, you know, it goes back to a kind of Turing test thing, you know, what is a conversation? How can you really have a conversation with a machine, etc.? But I, I think this was also strangely one of the stream of architectural theory since the Renaissance is what if architecture is actually a conversation? in which you gradually make something that we call architecture emerge. Right, nobody can stop the microphone guy mumbling by itself when it moves around. So last You're month... A, we you had, are the microphone? <laughs> last month we had doctor a conference here and somebody was talking again about post-humanism and I was yeah. thinking when are we going to look at the human rights of viruses? Well, this COVID quite has taken them. <laughs> so thank you very much for this very rich uh, lecture. Really a lot of ideas. I noted down you know, the Ruskin of the 21st century, how to keep uh, the robots happy would be the question for Ruskin of the 21st century, you know, because the creative, idea <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> then we but assume they could be happy, but creative, it's different. But, um, um, my question is really about this conversation. Uh -huh. and, and I wonder how much is it a conversation? Um, and um, Because the examples you gave, starting from this Philibert Delorme, it's, it's really, it's not, an e it's not a conversation of equals. There's a, there's a power relation in this conversation. It's, it's also about teaching architecture, it's also about repetition. And, um, and when we come to the 20th century, the conversation sort of, and the industrialization where you ended mm -hmm. partly, um, this conversation sort of becomes so um, sort of dissolved between multiple bodies that it sort of falls apart by the 70s and there's this reaction it's a very strong reaction in, mm. in the 80s towards this conversation and, and kind of a desire to invent a new kind of conversation. So I wonder, you know, how do you revive this now? Uh, it, it, it seems there's this very strong kind of... Um, the moment in the 80s was to take back power by the architects, in a way, and in, in which, which they had lost in the conversation, whereas now, I mean, would, would, would there be a new kind of a dissolvement or, or what, what is the position of the architect in this conversation nowadays? It's a super complicated question, to be honest. I, 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 that's a personal answer, so uh, take it as 
what it is, so I have no certitude. I do believe that the age of the Superman architect is a little bit over that we need more distributed, in some ways, conversation. In some ways, you know, uh, I, I see at Harvard, uh, when I arrived in the early 2000s, everybody wanted to be Rem Kouras. So we had a full range of baby Kouras, you know, or baby Superman, you know, the, w waiting to reveal a big K, like uh, the ES of Superman. That was a little bit the ambience. I'm struck today by the fact that this is less a dream than, you know, new form of collective doesn't mean, which is why the robots are interesting. It's not about making them necessarily happy. It's making them, allowing them to be a little bit creative. So I, I think, you know, one of the big questions today is how to distribute creation is for me one of the questions. Now on the symmetry, and interestingly, by the way, you mentioned teaching. Why is it that we teach, spend our time these days to teach our machines? So there is something, and let's not forget that teaching is, of course, symmetric. You know, I hate it when students have it right on me, but still, it's more, you know, it's there again more distributed than you might want to imagine because you do evolve in, by the sheer exchange with students. You change your mind. I'm probably very different now than I, what I was, not only because what I've read, but generation of students I've seen. And sometimes they've changed my mind on a number of problems uh, because, you know, they have different vision, etc. You know, and even introducing unfamiliar things for me. Uh, so I, I do think there is, yes, a teaching may be an analogy, but only a partial analogy. And by the end of teaching, interestingly, you know, when they graduate, you are by definition, you know, the, the hierarchy is over if there were... Uh, ever any. So I think this is a little bit uh, what may be happening. But conversation with machines is not a completely evident thing because, uh, you know, uh, to what I think it is really related how to go beyond having the machine as a mere tool, which is really the question of the 1960s. Again, Negroponte, it's very striking when you read Negroponte in the 1960s, the architecture machine group, it's very much about really computer-aided design. The machine is helping to design. And that disappeared in the late 70s and is reappearing now. So, and this is evidently not solved yet, but uh, we are rediscovering this question. We'll go according to the height of the audience. Hi. Mm, so uh, you said that one of the fundamental questions of architecture is uh, what kind of spaces we want to inhabit, right? Uh, and, and you touched a little bit about uh, that the we might be changing in the sense that not, not only humans, but maybe also robots. In long-term future? Yeah, yes. Yeah. But what about the space part? Because the concept of space is already changing even for us humans. We inhabit more and more the non-physical spaces like the virtual space. Do you see that this is fundamentally changing the concept of architecture? Or you, sp or you rather prefer that the architecture is reserved for the physical space and the other spaces we inhabit to have kind of other fields? Okay, I, on that question, I have a mix of very retrograde and not so retrograde thinking. The first is that we still have bodies. And, you know, uh, for uh, at a certain moment in my life, I worked a little bit on cities and war. And unfortunately, I've seemed to be back to, uh, you know, the actuality of this subject. And then you realize that, of course, we can inhabit virtual world. But, you know, when shells begin to, to you know, uh, we still inhabit the physical world in which we are born and die. So that's my retrograde part, uh, which is that architecture still, 
it's not the only way to be an architect. You know, Boulet, there are lots of architects have done architecture, both paper architecture, imaginary architecture, etc. But ultimately, architecture is still, and when I say space, not necessarily space as the modern, architecture makes places for humans. It's or more generally design. We design spaces in which humans have a place. Which it was, by the way, at the Renaissance, you know, Renaissance architecture, one of its aim was to create a place where humans could be human. You know, which goes back to this idea of the stage. Or, you know, if you take a more ancient myth, you know, Rom Rom Romulus tracing the limits of the city, the Pomerium. And within these limits, this is where politics happen, etc. So I would say that's one of the function. Now, we've always lived in an augmented world. We've always ha have painting, arts, poetry, etc. So I tend to believe that all the metaverse that we've heard about, etc., they are augmentation of this physical world. And it's quite striking, by the way, that very often the meta all the metaverses are still very much emulating the physical world. So we're augmenting the world. It's clear that we live in a space now which is a kind of hybrid of atoms and, and bits of information. So this is what you know, cities have become, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, we live in these augmented things. But you know, uh, immersive environment, there, you, there is a long history of immersive environment. You know, the first guy who painted animals on a, gro on a cavern a wall was already augmenting a little bit the space. So we are in more sophisticated probably more, you know, uh, powerful modes of uh, augmentation. But it doesn't for me. So that goes back to the question of the post-human. What strikes me as for me is how human is the very notion of post-human. We've dreamt to be post-humans, you know, from the day we invented angels and other creatures. Uh, we've dreamt to be more than humans, you know, uh, for a very, very long time. And we had heroes and gods, uh, which were avatars of, you know, this dream. Uh, so that's also because actually we need to be reassured on the fact that, we, yes, we are humans. And uh, or so. So that's why I believe that in some ways, you know, what is a bit complicated with artificial intelligence is, yes, it's completely new and the machines are very new. And at the same time, they are actually reactivating some of our oldest uh, questions, including the Frankenstein fear. You know, the Frankenstein fear, which before that you have the golem or whatever, you know, the fear of animation. What is it? Uh, with artificial life, which is one of the oldest questions. If you look, you know, stories of artificial life are extremely ancient. Yes, uh, there was a question, I think, upstairs, and then... Thank you. Um, my question might be related to the previous ones, but I, I will use a different kind of uh, discourse, a different kind of uh, mm, phrasing. Um, some years ago, also accidentally in log, I believe, there was an interview with uh, Peter Eisenman, and um, they were talking accidentally with... Accidentally in log? Sorry? <laughs> I was saying, Peter Eisenman is in log is definitely an accident, as we all know. But it, it was a special issue on uh, taking stock uh, de dedicated to Rainer Banham, I believe. Um, and uh, there was a conversation between Jeff Kipnis, I believe, and uh, Eisenman, and they were talking about architecture as a discipline and how uh, architecture as a discipline is changing all the time through the history, mm -hmm. and it keeps changing. Um, at one point, Kipnis uh, asked Eisenman, how does he define discipline or architecture as a discipline? And... Uh, Eisenman said something like that, that uh, a discipline becomes a discipline uh, at the point when it is able to self-reflect and mm -hmm. becomes aware of itself. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, it kind of relates to consciousness, mm -hmm. which is a very human thing. Now, if we imagine uh, the developments uh, related to AI and um, maybe also what has been described as post-humanism, 
if these spheres um, enter architecture as a discipline, then it seems that Eisenman's, uh, Eisenman's uh, definition does not work anymore. Um, I'm not sure um, what is the question here exactly, but I would be really interested to hear. Very Eisenmannian, yes. <laughs> But uh, but I, I would I would be interested in here how would you uh, and if you are willing uh, to define this new kind of architecture discipline or architecture as a discipline um, okay. in relation it. to AI I, that I can do uh, I think Eisenman has a point though you know, his definition of architecture tends to be a little bit narrow by the end, a little bit too Western-centric, et cetera, et cetera. I think architecture is what happens when the arts of buildings that may be non-Western begin precisely to become reflexive, et cetera. So, but it doesn't mean that becoming reflexive tells you what you exactly are. I think architecture is a discipline which has built itself on its incertitude about being a discipline, which is why it constantly needs to be reassured, uh, probably because it has so much link with the definition of the human or the post-human. You know, it's not a coincidence that the post-human is arriving like a tsunami in design circles and not only in the Beatrice Colomina uh, backyard. Uh, it has arrived everywhere because actually architecture is about, again, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to inhabit? Why is it, and uh, you know, you take the primitive heart, you take all the founding myths of architecture has to do with questions such as inhabiting, etc. So I would go as far as to say that actually artificial intelligence will be probably the central theoretical question in the years to come because of that. It's not going to tell us exactly what design is. It's going actually to destabilize a lot of things we believe design was. So which is, uh, but to be complete about the question, there is a very, as profound a destabilization going on with climate change. You know, what does it mean to, to, build, to take seriously the idea that buildings are just a frozen moment in a flow, which is basically what all the, you know, the carbon uh, thing, gray energy, et cetera, lead to? What does it mean? You know, all these questions go v towards a kind of radical unsettling of, you know, the certitudes of the discipline. Uh, and, uh, yes, architecture is a discipline that has changed a lot, and this is not over. It's going to change again and again. Uh, where I would be more pragmatic is I still think that in design school, you learn specific skills and sensitivities to certain problems, etc., which are, you know, still, you know, if you take, for example, urban planning. In a team of urban planners, if there is an architect, he usually will end up with a pencil. Uh, so there is something with architecture still, but it's, architecture doesn't fit all the traditional reassuring pattern of an academic discipline. It's something of a different nature. And which is why, again, you know, I was not drawn towards AI because uh, it's fancy. It just, I think, just like with the environmental change, I think those are probably the two most challenging question for the discipline, if we call, uh, call. But I would argue, for example, that architecture is uh, actually have a slightly more complex, I like complexity, you may have noticed. I think architecture is actually a tree pod. It's a discipline, yes, why not? But it's also a tradition. That's to say we keep in mind a series of exemplary buildings that we modify and curate, etc., from one period to another. And it's by the end also a conversation. So it's the three elements, uh, which are actually relatively, um, they are irreducible completely one to another, even if they have relations. So as you can see, I, I succeeded in trying to be even more complicated than Eisenman. Yeah, you put together AI several times it gets itself a consciousness and then you find out that it's Ray Kurzweil's consciousness. Perhaps to be determined, but we have to teach it. Don't forget that. 
uh, once uh, again, I was thinking that the AI business, perhaps you've mixed this up with accounting input because, uh, you know, if you're going to go down this road of machine design, then I'm asking myself, why is this distance in this chair so fucking uncomfortable? Because... Uh, that I don't know, Estonian design, you know. Yeah. I, I won't take any side in so, that story. Uh, like Michael Green, the architect, he, who has spoken very much recently on the the, the aim of the architect is to actually uh, build for the people, uh, not for the accountant. And uh, we're really not uh, solving this problem. If you look at architecture today, uh, we're, we're missing the kind of assignment. And uh, uh, if a machine was looking at the criterion, then we would disseminate between the, the value of the square meter, the cost of the square meter, the inflated price of, uh, let's say, uh, oh, betting on the market, uh, artificially increasing the, the values of space that has no value, other than you know we're making it more expensive. Uh, and then we come down to the fact that you, know, you, you still need to build uh, a door and a roof and a, a shelter for a human. And this is the challenge, and this is where the machine perhaps uh, will make a better choice because they're going to be um, a little bit less, uh, how would you say, influenced. Uh, well, it depends on who's inputting their data, of course. So, well, I think you can influence machine. Don't forget once again. You know what I found quite interesting with the face recognition racial bias. You know, machine end up having the bias that we have sometimes involuntarily imparted them with. Uh, no, what I retain is, you know, part of the reason architecture is very dependent on computation. You mentioned the distance between seat. This is what Neufert, for example, typically, you know, uh, I don't know about this auditorium, but, you know, Neufert is still republished, of course, reactualized, etc. So part of architecture, yes, is something that you can mechanize. But, uh, but you know, it may be also sometimes that inconfortable auditorium make a better space, which is uh, also... So this one, I don't know. I agree it's really a bit tight, but... Uh, but, uh, you know, are inhabiting, you know, sometimes absurdities in a home makes its value. So, we, which, is, which is a little bit, for me, the theme of the glitch. You know, sometimes, you know, architecture is a perturbation of a very wise Neufert-inspired uh, scheme. And, and this is what makes, all of a sudden, the value of a space. So, uh, the, so, so far, so we may teach probably eventually a machine to do that. Nothing is impossible, but so far we do that relatively better. Uh, so architecture, yes, there is a lot of computation in architecture, which is why I do think this is one of the art in which AI well, though, you know, I was really struck the other day by the kind of text you get now with this uh, program that predicts the next word thing, which is quite fascinating. You know, I'm thinking actually two-thirds of what I write. Probably the machine is less clear than me still. That's my hope, but I'm not even sure. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, there are still... You know, things, you know, you take text, for example, it's very troubling what is taking place now. So uh, architecture, I'm ready to bet, will soon be there. So far, you know, most of what we see is still a bit weird, but uh, this is probably going to evolve much quicker than what we think. Uh, hello. Uh, thank Second you for this. Last, beware. Thank you for this uh, amazing presentation. Uh, I'm not an architect, but I'm doing my PhD in, in AI, and I'm an artist. And it was really striking that many things that you said, and especially the conversation. Uh, some of my last pieces in academia are about um, this interface of um, text to, to different ways. Uh, I don't know if you know, there's a semitician of Estonia, very, very famous, Yuri Lodman. 
um, that talks about the translation of semiotic spaces as a way of creativity. And I think... I knew I had to learn Estonian at some point, yes. I've been it's translated to many languages. <laughs> okay. and, and actually, that was some of... Uh, I had related to the latest articles that I, uh, uh -huh. I wrote about, because I think when you talk about conversation and this conversation with the machine, it's actually this misimprecisions of translation is the creativity what is emerging is actually what Lodman um, uh, I have to was. Read that. Can you send me the reference? You know, please. Of course. And I also, I will invite you to get a, a book from ECA was publishing. The, um, is the, the meaning of creativity in the age of AI uh, that just came out. I have an article there and a few other people. in. Uh, in if ECA. you have an article there, I'm going to rush on it. Promise. Well, sorry, no, but it's like Eka published uh, and just came out, and I think it's really nice. No, no, no that's uh, good uh, references, so send yeah. me that, please. And basically, I think that Negroponte, uh, when you said about the co-design, actually is pretty, pretty interesting because it was at the same time that Elisa uh, was invented in, in MIT. But I think that the problem is because I had inside, probably they had seen that Elisa um, was, was, was just like um, very dumb. Um, but and, and, and what we have now is generative models that really um, can, can do much more. I and, agree. Uh, and, and I think that what you say conversation is actually the, the more general intelligence that we have now is the language models. Even, even though um, by, by some literature they say that the, 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 um, the text models, they, they just get the, the form but not the meaning. And that is why it's very dangerous. There's this, this paper about the parrots of the uh, stochastic parrots of the mm. text um, uh, models and language models. And, and, but, but still, for creativity, is, is something that is, is really like um, very interesting. And, and when, you, when you actually said about them, them giving freedom to the machines, well, just we were in Bilbao now doing a residency doing clay with AI model generated. Um, sculptures, and, and I, I can say that you showed there some pictures. The clay is alive, and the clay uh, actually it moves how how a little bit once, uh, even if it, even if it's 3D printed, um, it's, it's not like the same. For example, the plastic. We did the same um, models with plastic, with a big arm robot, and it behaved quite more constant than the clay. It means actually, it's also about materiality. Um, uh, means and, and, and maybe new materiality that we are we are building with um, uh, more organic, more um, uh, alive. I think we seem to share a number of obsessions, so that's good that we met. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Th because I I agree. I think for me one of the big limits, precisely, of you know, is that architecture is never completely linguistic, guess what? It is always partly irreducible to language, even if part of it is actually close to language. In the book on materiality, I have a chapter in which I argue that architecture is always trying to come near to language, but never achieves that, that because it is material, and materiality has always escaped linguistic effects. So it's a little bit like, like your clay. I need to read you. In, uh, so, yeah, so uh, definitely. Definitely. So please send me the reference. You know, historians love res references. The idea of conversation was actually linked to the fact that, you know, I, you know, I've worked a lot on old, fa old uh, prior times. This is a very powerful notion in the 16th, 17th century, then get lost and then get rediscovered, but it's a kind of constant stream in architecture. Sorry. Last question from... Uh from, I guess, from practicing architect's point of view. Um, I you know that's not my strong point. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be a strong point. But uh, I, I was wondering about the Im impact of design tools, like showing Corbus office, how it got really in, like intercontinental. Uh -huh. You would have like a, I mean, web of authors. Uh, also, I would say maybe also losing a bit of um, sensitivity of a uh, context or somewhat cultivating the modernism and and we here in Estonia have seen a lot of projects because we are living in a periphery where, where there's a Google. You love that periphery thing. I've noted that. Uh, there is yeah. a kind of But like literally having Google Maps designed. Um, <laughs> 
Google Maps design buildings or even shopping malls, meaning that the architect has not even visited the site uh, in order to mm -hmm. design it from, from, from a distance. So I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you see some uh, big threats in, uh, in the design tools, or if you look at this last century of development, then what are the, those things to keep in mind? Uh, that um, where are the tendencies of, uh, of practicing architects uh, picking them up and, and maybe not re really realizing what they will be missing once applying them? Yeah, multiple answer, I think. You know, uh, there is the famous thing by Cedric Price, you know, technology answer, answer the question, but what was the question actually? Uh, or myself, I prefer more modestly to say, you know, technology never solve actually problem, they displace them. Uh, but I think technology is never a pure gain or whatever, it displaces stakes. And it's pretty clear that believing naively that the digital has improved between brackets, et cetera, is a naive take. Uh, so you have, for example, already the crisis of scale. You, when you design by hand, there was a kind of commensurability between your body and what you designed. This is broken. So it means that you have to reconstitute a relation between the body, et cetera, that is mediated much more than before. So that uh, you have the risk of abstraction. You have also organizational risk. It is pretty clear that the digital goes with a certain type of tendency to become more bureaucratically savvy, and which is why also, you know, design. It really strikes me, by the way, we have so many discourses in School of Architecture, elegant discourses like mine sometimes about what the digital is doing to the discipline, etc. And very few discourses on the profession. While the effect on the profession have been massive, and, you know, AI, for example, I'm pretty persuaded it's going actually to reinforce the effect on the profession. Because guess what? It's going also to mean uh, there was an interesting article recently in the Harvard uh, alumni magazine, which is not especially distinguished, it's, uh, but nevertheless, uh, there is a guy at Harvard arguing that actually the Chinese have a decisive advantage in AI because they're a big surveillance-oriented society, and this is good for AI, because you can run millions and millions of faces, of IDs, etc., and AI thrives on that. Whereas in democracy, in which you protect, etc., AI uh, development is a bit hampered. All that to say that their AI may very well reinforce the competitive advantage of big structure for example, which nobody talks about in the design world so far. You know, it's as if AI, everybody could afford its very sophisticated AI system. Truth is, you know, AI may reinforce a number of professional dynamics. I wrote a piece a few years ago precisely on, you know, the question of the profession because it really struck me, you know, we've... You know, I was struck by, you know, I remember one of my colleagues telling me in the East Coast, with 50 people 20 years ago, you were a big fish. Today, with 50 people, you're barely visible uh, on the East Coast. Uh, you're barely visible. You're actually a small fish in the design world. Uh, you can survive. 50 is still the threshold at which you can survive, but you cannot thrive because thriving means hundreds of people in a lot of places. And, you know, take go back to China. China has this giant architectural practices, etc. But even, you know, take Zahadi, the fact that, you know, Zaha or Herzog and de Moreau were talking about hundreds of people. So, uh, and, uh, you know, without computer tools, without what they facilitate, you know, for example, computer tools enable to sieve information hierarchically so that the top has access to certain things. So even the circuits of information you know, somebody who got it right in that respect was Reinhold Mardin in the organizational complex when he argues that the cybernetic moment is really in sync with a number of reorganization of firms in America. We failed simply to apply that to architecture, but, uh, but this is actually real. Uh, and this may be, I think AI will probably give an advantage, competitive advantage to certain types of structure upon others.
uh, right now we're doing as if you know these technologies were free for everyone everybody would have a, you know AI available on Google and it would be fine it's probably not going to happen that way but again I'm not a practitioner it's easier to be a you know historians are very good at profitizing the past that was the last question now it's the minus question <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to make it short. Um, um, you, you showed the um, calculus um, equation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the profession has developed quite a lot by using encapsulated knowledge, like um, tools or models that have been kind of handed down so you can use them easily. So it's the process of design becomes more easy. But until now, we've always been able to look into that model and grasp the model and comprehend what it is actually doing. And now we're entering this phase where these tools become uh, super intelligent and the workflow becomes even more intuitive, like lines snap to each other by themselves, corner situations get uh, solved. Uh, and at one point, we won't really need the, the profession anymore. It becomes maybe too easy uh, to design with those tools. That's why I'm saying that you have to move strategic. The how, you know, how to treat the angle, etc. Yes, the machine will be probably able because it will have a catalog. You take, for example, a classic problem in the 17th century from the Renaissance onwards is how do you turn with the Doric order? Because the Doric order has a problem at the angle. And that's one of the oldest you can see. Uh, so, and there are a number of technical solutions. Pretty much a machine, you fit it with all the solution ever used to turn with a Doric ordinance and the machine will be able to do it better than you. So to take an old fashioned example, you take the uh, horizontal window of the modern, how you stop it, etc. You feed all the horizontal window of every modernist villa ever built. It's going to do it better than you. But it's not going to answer so far the question, what is it you want? And that's what I'm arguing, that you have to move toward a more strategic take. You have to discover that actually architecture becomes more and more what is my choice? What am I picking among the various uh, possibilities, etc.? Which is already the case with the computer. The computer can produce a seamless flow of solution. And you have actually to pick at a number of stages what it does. I actually see the, the threat in the client who thinks they know. Yeah, but that exists already. You know, most client around the world, the threat is actually, I'm not so sure, because the threat already exists. You know, architect control barely a few percent of the world built environment. The threat is actually all these catalogs of existing plants, you know, all these people who built, you know, houses on models that are circulated widely, etc. The threat is all that already and has been with us for a very long time. I think the machine gives you the opportunity, you know, the machine will need some serious steering and management. Again, somebody to talk with the machine. The machine actually, strangely, the machine is less passive than a catalog of things that you just copycat, which is, you know, most of the suburban houses are copycat. Forum from established model and usually when they change something it you can be sure it's the worst solution there was a very funny thesis at Harvard about Mac mansions and postmodern country Mac mansions who usually get it always wrong the proportion of the column is absurd usually the frontispice end as it should never end etc you know worse than you know las vegas compared to is is miracle of vitruvian harmony uh, so uh, uh, so i think compared to that the machine is actually a chance for the architect i believe the machine because the machine will need sophisticated interlocutors in order to really produce interesting stuff because the rest you have it already in the worst uh, you know, the worst manner. 
you know, I don't think, I think even in Estonia, I'm sure there must be a ton of people doing very ugly things directly with the entrepreneur without even thinking that they could pay a designer. Because of course we know designers are too expensive. So, except if Estonia is a miracle, but maybe. And with that optimistic note, <laughs> we, we yeah. call for human rights to artificial intelligence and then this inspiring lecture. Thank you. Don't worry. We'll take